Hi, welcome to Premium Builds, I'm John. Well, that's enough about motherboards for now. Let's get back to some gaming. I've had a week off due to COVID, but that has enabled me to put in some sim time. So let's talk about Flight Simulator 2020. This is a truly next generation title capable of using AI and data from Bing graphics to render the whole world in stunning detail. It's a truly fantastic experience and one I'd like as many people to enjoy as possible, but it's got a reputation as being really hard on hardware. Is that really fair? Do you need an absolutely top flight PC to run this game well? Well, I've been testing it for over a year now, and I'd like to dispel some of the myths about this title. We've got testing here from a range of equipment, from CPUs like the i3 up to i9 CPUs, Ryzen CPUs as well, RAM from 8GB up to 64GB tested, and a range of GPUs at various settings as well, so that you can pick the hardware that's going to really enable you to get the most out of this fantastic title. And I'm going to apologise now for switching between calling it a game and a sim throughout this video. I probably treat it a little bit more like a game than some people do, and I appreciate that some people do take it incredibly seriously. This information is important to them as well, and I have tested in a way that is relevant to simmers as well as people who just want to casually enjoy this game. But let's face it, this title's available on Xbox now, people can play it with a controller as well, and part of dispelling that elitist myth about the kind of hardware you need to run a sim like Flight Simulator 2020 is the purpose of this video. I want to show that you can actually get a great experience on this PC title with really quite modest hardware. In this video I've tried to get scientific with it. I've broken it down component by component, isolating variables, in order to really dig down into which components matter most to get this game running well. To clarify, by build the best, I don't just mean choose the best of everything. That would be too easy for me, and it wouldn't be fair on you as well if I come up at the end and say you need to spend $5,000 to get a PC that's going to run this game well. It's also not true. Our goal here is to find out where you can get the most performance for your money, whether you're building a PC from scratch with Flight Sim 2020 as a consideration, or perhaps you're experiencing poor performance on your current PC and you want to know where you need to spend your money to rectify that situation and get the best experience possible. At the end of the video I'll suggest some PC configurations to get great performance at any budget, using current components so you can maximise your money. We've used two benchmark tests here. One involves a low-level flight over Manhattan in a lighter aircraft. The other is a takeoff sequence in a 747 at Heathrow. Both represent demanding worst-case scenarios, but they highlight slightly different aspects of a PC's performance, as well as different ways people enjoy this sim. One aspect I do want to explain is the significance of the metrics I'm presenting here. The vital ones are the overall average, as an indication of system performance. I've then also reported the 1% and 0.1% lows. These metrics are the average of the worst 1% and worst 0.1% brackets of frame rates respectively. They give an indication of the frame time consistency. A very low 0.1% result indicates that a few frames are taking significantly longer to render, and this is perceived as a stutter or hang in gameplay. It's those stutters that really ruin immersion. Even more than average frame rates, it's the 1% and 0.1% low performance that dictates how smoothly we perceive a game to be running. That's why they're important, and I will refer to them throughout these results where they represent significant differences. Also, I know a lot of people will be really interested in the testing methodology, but it's relatively involved, so I've included a section on that at the end. So if you're going through this video and you find some of my results improbable or unbelievable, please do just refer to the end of that video and see if you think my testing methodology has impacted the results that I'm showing here. If you think there are odds, then please feel free to call me out in the comments, or perhaps present some of your own testing as well if you've got components I don't have access to. I'd be really interested to see how they perform, and also how perhaps my testing methodology could be improved. So strap in, because this video could save you an awful lot of money, or just help you optimise your current system to get the best performance out of Flight Sim 2020. And please, if you appreciate the results of over 300 individual benchmark runs, over 40 hours of testing in benchmarks presented in this video, please do click like and tick that subscribe button as well, so you can help us produce these kind of videos and get this information to you so you can build the best PCs possible. So let's get down to it, let's take a look at what it means to build the best PC for Flight Simulator 2020. First up, let's take a look at CPUs. The sim engine for Flight Simulator is demanding, but what specific features of a CPU are important? Looking at our overall results in the New York flyover benchmark, we can make the broad observation that better CPUs are, well, better, but which factors really matter? You might be tempted to assume that the core count is the primary factor in performance, but the results here indicate that it isn't. The i9-10850K with 10 cores fares worse than lower core count CPUs in this test, and in fact it's matched by the 4-core i3-12100F. 
What we see here is newer CPUs doing significantly better, but why? Using a separate benchmark involving a 747 taking off at London Heathrow, which is an even more CPU dominated test, shows similar results. The 12th gen i3 actually beats out the 10 core 10th generation i9 in this test, whilst the overclocked 12th generation i7 stretches its lead. The Zen 3 5800X is also doing well, obtaining 60 frames per second. We can specifically test for the impact of core count by switching off CPU cores and rerunning the benchmarks on the 5800X and the i9 10850K. Doing this yields results that are perhaps surprising until we understand how Flight Simulator 2020 is coded. It appears that stepping these CPUs down to 6 and even 4 active cores does little to harm performance, and whilst the Ryzen shows a slight trend for better performance with core counts, the Intel i9 shows more varied results. Note that the 0.1% and 1% lows do improve with core count, however we're not seeing anything like linear scaling with more cores. A second run of tests using the Ryzen 5800X in the London Heathrow takeoff benchmark confirms this. This test, like before, is even more CPU dominated, and even a heavy aircraft in a complex environment does not benefit substantially from higher core counts. These runs are all very similar, and even 4 cores has no substantial impact on the 0.1% low results, which is where you would expect to pick up stutters and poor performance as we overstep a CPU's capacity. Realistically, this is a margin of error result in the testing between the 6 and the 8 core results, and the 4 core isn't at a level where you'd perceive any difference in frame rates. We can conclude that there's no scaling with core count in Flight Simulator 2020 beyond 4 and certainly 6 cores. There was some hope that a move to DirectX 12 could see better usage of high core count CPUs, but sadly it's not that simple. The game engine itself runs on a single main thread, and breaking that apart isn't a trivial task for the developers. In fact, with the game now much better optimised and a big portion of its audience on console, I wouldn't anticipate any major advances in multi-core usage going forwards. DirectX 12 is worse than DirectX 11 right now. So if core count isn't important, what does matter in terms of CPU performance then? Going back to our key results helps us here. The two factors that have a primary impact on flight sim's performance are single core speed and a large level 3 cache. This is the real reason for the different scaling between Intel and AMD CPUs. AMD give you 32 megabytes of level 3 cache per core cluster, and their peak clock speeds don't actually vary that much between products. A 5600X performs much the same as a 5900X if you don't need the core count, and the cache is split between the two core clusters on those higher end Ryzen 9 CPUs, meaning that any particular set of cores only has 32 megabytes available, the same as in a 5600X or 5800X. Intel, on the other hand, take a much more aggressive approach to product segmentation. In moving from i3 to i5 and then i7 and beyond, you're not just buying faster cores as denoted by the boost clock speeds, you're also getting more level 3 cache as you step up the product stack. It's this combination of faster cores and larger cache size that lead to the more marked performance increases across the Intel product lineup when we're looking at the 12th generation Alder Lake CPUs. And across the board, this is why more modern CPUs perform better. They have IPC improvements which allow the CPU cores to perform more efficiently, getting more done with each clock cycle. And that's why a modern CPU is the single biggest improvement you can make to performance on Flight Simulator 2020. Our conclusions here are pretty clear cut. To run Flight Simulator 2020 well, you need a fast modern CPU with at least four but preferably six cores. You need very high individual core speed and plenty of level three cache as well. The Ryzen 5600X is a great option on a budget, whilst the Intel i5-12400 is a fantastic starting point as well. Moving up to the K-series and i7 12th gen CPUs will buy you more performance, but it's through both single core speed and cache increases, not core count. Remember, you can buy more powerful and expensive CPUs, but you're probably not buying a great deal of additional performance, as other components limit overall performance as we'll show later. Only consider them if you're already getting the best GPUs and RAM you can afford. More recent CPUs fare better through IPC improvements, faster single core speed, and whilst the cheaper Intel i3 CPUs are easy to overlook, the 12th generation shouldn't be dismissed out of hand. If they're what you can afford, you can still get acceptable gaming performance out of them at just $100 to $120. It's insane how well the i3-12100 does in this title, for example. It's a four-core CPU with that very fast individual core speed that means that it can match the i9-10850K, a 10-core CPU flagship, or one step below flagship from Intel, released just two years ago at $450. You've now got a $120 CPU that will match it in Flight Simulator 2020. But it's 2022 and I'm not going to tell you to buy a four-core CPU for this or any other demanding game if you can afford slightly better. Options like the Ryzen 5600X and the 12400 to 12600 and 12600K exist and provide a great deal more performance in this title and for more general use 
use for relatively little extra investment. Obviously at the high end an i9-12900K will offer the best performance possible at the moment with a high 5.2GHz boost clock and 30MB of level 3 cache, but in our opinion the i7-12700K offers the best balance of performance and cost at the high end, giving high clock speeds and 25MB of level 3 cache. The Ryzen series don't offer significant benefits for the cost past the 5600X, but they are strong performance. The upcoming Ryzen 5800X 3D has a massive level 3 cache, however its clock speeds have been taken a notch down, so it will be interesting to see how it performs in Flight Sim 2020 versus the original 5800X. As an aside, we'd love to see good data on the Ryzen 5900 and 5950X. If you've got those CPUs and you don't believe my testing here and you think that core count is a factor, particularly in those 1% and 0.1% lows, then by all means run some testing and get back to us. We'd love to see your results. Another contentious issue with Microsoft Flight Simulator 2020 is how much RAM you need to run this title well. Originally it did specify 32GB recommended on the spec sheet, but that's actually been revised downwards now to 16GB. And there's also been some major optimizations made, particularly with the release going out to Xbox as well. They've obviously really cut back the RAM demands of this game. So to test it we ran a range of RAM sizes and configurations in order to work out what's going to perform best. To test capacity, first up we ran the same benchmarks on the 5800X equipped with varying amounts of RAM in different configurations. We controlled speed and timings at 3200MHz CL16 throughout. Take a quick moment to double take these results, because they surprised us too and prompted a number of verification runs. In the New York City benchmark there does seem to be some small trend with RAM capacity, with a couple of frames per second improvement between 8GB, 16GB and 32GB configurations. This is in line with what you'd expect but the performance of just 8GB of RAM surprised us. Even the 1% and 0.1% lows don't suffer significantly, although you can perhaps see a slight trend towards more consistent performance from 8GB up to 32GB capacities. Note the obvious detriment of single stick configurations at the bottom of the chart. Single channel RAM hurts performance in almost all games, and Flight Sim is no exception here. We tested both our scenarios to see if there was any variance. In the Heathrow takeoff benchmark involving the 747, we see no significant difference between performance on 8, 16, 32 and even 64GB of dual channel RAM, which is remarkable. The 8GB kit is nominally on top, but that's within margin of error. In effect we can say that all of these configurations perform the same, but note a slight trend of improving 0.1% lows as we increase capacity, indicating a slight improvement in frame time consistency with larger RAM amounts. Overall then, while there can be minor differences in performance with RAM, we're not seeing any major scaling with capacity, and we're happy to say that 16GB is ample to run this game well. 32GB certainly would make sense if you're running very high settings, or with modded aircraft or scenery, however it's not a requirement to simply enjoy the title. Moving on to RAM speed, let's take a look at our data on how RAM speed impacts this title. It's perhaps more relevant to Flight Simulator 2020 than most because it runs so much closer to a CPU limit most of the time than other games. In other games you're probably getting very high frame rates and you're limited much more by your GPU, whereas the game engine is relatively non-critical and sitting with a good amount of headroom. On Flight Simulator 2020 you do frequently run into situations where you want as much CPU performance as possible because that's your ultimate frame rate limit and RAM does impact that, so let's take a look at the numbers. We've done significant work investigating RAM speeds on this and other games in the past, and broadly we know that RAM speed assists CPU performance and therefore results in potentially higher frame rates. To test this we ran 16GB of RAM in a 2x8GB configuration and varied the speeds as shown. It's well known that AMD's Ryzen CPUs are RAM speed sensitive, and our testing with the Ryzen 5800X bears this out. Moving from basic JDEC specification at 2400MHz CL16 through to speeds of 3200MHz and 3600MHz sees a substantial 15 frames per second improvement in average frame rates. The highest performance RAM we've been able to test is a Samsung BDI kit manually tuned to 3800MHz CL16 with Infinity Fabric and Memory Controller locked at 1 to 1 ratio. Given this RAM took several days to tune and verify stability, the out of box performance of 3600MHz CL16 RAM running XMP is far more attractive, giving away just 5 frames per second potentially and with near identical 1% and 0.1% lows. The 4000MHz spec uses slightly looser secondary timings to achieve stability and so doesn't perform quite as well overall. However, there's often a belief that RAM speed isn't as important for Intel. If we switch to the data from testing of the i7-12700K, we can see this isn't true. RAM speed matters just as much. 
We have the same 20 frame per second spread from the worst to the best RAM here, with the highest performing RAM being the DDR4 4000MHz Samsung B-Die kit at CL16 timings manually tweaked. Note that DDR5 is also included here, and it doesn't justify its cost. Whilst the G-Skill kit tested here clocks at 6000MHz, the high CL36 CAS latency means it's not able to challenge the best performing RAM, and it performs about the same as 3200MHz CL16 DDR4 RAM. For DDR4, once again, 3600MHz CL16 hits the sweet spot of cost, the ease of applying an out-of-the-box XMP profile, and good performance, making it our pick for Intel as well as Zen 3 Ryzen. To conclude our RAM section then, we can see that 16GB is sufficient to run this title well. Rather than spending money on very expensive high capacity kits, we'd suggest that you focus in on getting the best speed and timings of RAM possible to aid CPU performance. For an entry level setup, 16GB of 3600MHz CL16 RAM is probably optimal. For a more complex installation, 32GB is probably optimal and still allows you to get those fast kits with tight timings at an acceptable price without compromising the rest of the system or getting a really much larger capacity kit that actually has to run slower and will actually hurt performance versus a faster, smaller kit. We can also advise you to avoid single stick setups. They really do hurt performance and should be avoided at all costs for a number of reasons, not just Flight Simulator 2020 performance. And finally, if you are on a DDR5 platform already, Older Lake, or you're looking at DDR5 for uh, Zen 4 in the upcoming release later this year, we can say you really will need to focus in on getting the fastest RAM possible. You can see even some of the faster kits available today struggle against moderately priced DDR4 kits. So you will be looking at 5600 MHz as a minimum, 6000, 6400 MHz kits, with those timings brought down as low as possible to assist latency. It's that latency penalty for DDR5 that's hurting performance at the moment. We also tested a number of different RAM configurations here throughout our testing. I couldn't see any appreciable differences between four stick and two stick configurations, and that's paralleled with whether you're running dual rank or single rank sticks as well. I'd say there's not enough information to make a specific recommendation either way there, and you get plenty of performance out of a dual stick kit. Overall then, RAM speed and timings do assist CPU performance, and because CPU performance is so critical to the overall experience of Flight Simulator 2020, that's where you should focus your energies when you're looking for RAM or for building a system. We did conduct some brief testing on loading times with SSDs, a frustration in this title, to see if faster SSDs made any particular mark on waiting times. Our data here is messy, in that owing to the combination of systems we have available for test, they're not controlled for CPU. We've also found significant run-to-run -run variants, read sometimes 30 seconds additional for no apparent reason, in our results. We're including this to demonstrate that unfortunately even fast SSDs such as the Sabrent Rocket 4.0 don't appear to have any marked advantage in load times, and one of the slowest drives under the test, the Intel 660p, shows one of the fastest load times. Please don't base any purchasing decisions off of this slide. We're really including it here just to show that we did try. Our conclusions really for SSDs are that while they're a must, you shouldn't agonise over spending extra on a high performance SSD for this title on the expectation of improved loading times. Other factors in the system matter more, and it's so random that realistically you're probably not going to get a huge benefit from a spend here. However, what we would prioritise is getting an SSD at least, you certainly do want to run a large demanding title like this off of an SSD and making sure that it's at least 500 gigabytes in capacity. We'd say that's the bare minimum for a PC dedicated to Flight Simulator 2020, with even a basic install and updates now running at 230 gigabytes. So whilst we found that Flight Simulator is much more dependent on CPU performance than a lot of titles, it is still the GPU that's gonna dictate ultimately the settings, resolution, and frame rates you're going to achieve. So let's take a look at some of our testing here. Please do accept our apologies that we haven't got the widest range of graphics cards available for testing here. We don't get given graphics cards by manufacturers and as I'm sure you're aware the last year or so hasn't been the most conducive to obtaining or keeping hold of uh, graphics cards. They've been a pretty expensive investment. First up let's check out GPU performance at 1080p resolution with high settings. Here we can see that the RTX 2060 sets the baseline for performance, achieving 60 frames per second average as close as possible on high settings. We do have legacy data for the 1660 Super and found that acceptable as well, achieving around 50 frames per second in this test. Lower tier cards like the 1650 Super will require settings being lowered to medium, but are still perfectly functional. 
The 6600 XT acquits itself well at this resolution, giving 61 frames per second average. As we approach 100 frames per second using the higher tier cards, you can see that the very high end isn't really appropriate at this resolution. You're spending a huge amount to go from the 99 frames per second of the 3060 Ti to the 112 frames per second of the RTX 3080 Ti, and it's the CPU that's dictating the performance with these cards at this lower resolution. Any of the cards above the 3060 Ti are better suited to a higher resolution monitor. An RTX 3050 is also going to be perfectly acceptable at 1080p, but we'd avoid the AMD RX 6500 XT, owing to a number of issues in performance of that card that extend beyond its capability in flight sim. Stepping up to 1440p, we can see a dramatic fall off in the performance of the 6600 XT and the RTX 2060 at this resolution. With adjusted settings, they will work acceptably well, but they're not ideal. The RTX 3060 Ti and RTX 3070 achieve a comfortable 60 frames per second, and an RX 6700 XT will do likewise. The RTX 3080 and 3080 Ti achieve 90 and 105 frames per second respectively, but again, this is really overkill and overspend at this resolution. Note that the lower 0.1% lows in particular indicate that we're hitting a CPU limitation with these top tier GPUs even at 1440p. Moving up again, we've tested ultra-wide owing to our preference for it in many Sims and AAA titles. 1440p ultra-wide splits the difference between a QHD or 1440p and 4K, and the results demonstrate that. Here we can see the RTX 3070 becoming the threshold card for 60 frames per second performance, with the RTX 3080 and RTX 3080 Ti delivering 70 and 96 frames per second respectively. With any of these cards, it will be worth tweaking the settings to get your preferred balance of visual detail and performance. And finally, at 4K, we can see that even the highest performance cards are working hard to deliver 60 frames per second. Realistically, at 4K, you're looking at as much GPU as you can afford, with the RTX 3080 Ti delivering 60 frames per second average in this demanding scenario. I would add that this is a takeoff and low level urban scenario that's particularly hard on the GPU, and you can expect to add about 50% to frame rates when flying at altitude. So, to conclude for GPUs, Whilst it is a demanding title, this isn't actually dramatically out of step with other recommendations for games and gaming GPUs. At 1080p, you'll get great results out of things like the RTX 3050, 3060, or the RX 6600 XT, or the 6600 from AMD. Moving up to 1440p, you'll be looking at cards like the RTX 3060 Ti or RTX 3070, or the AMD RX 6700 XT for good performance. And finally, up at 4K or using VR, you will need to dust off the wallet because you're going to need a very high-end GPU, the RTX 3080, 3080 Ti, or even 3090, or the RX 6800 XT or 6900 XT from AMD to get an acceptable frame rate, 60 frames per second plus, at uh, high settings that really do this title justice. A quick note about VR. I do play this title a lot in VR myself on an RTX 3080 Ti, and I enjoy really good quality settings um, and good consistent performance with it. I have looked at uh, benchmarking and trying to ascertain exactly where the cutoff point is for GPUs with it. However, there's just so many variables to consider, including headset specifications, render scaling, visual settings, and of course individual tolerances for lower frame rates, that I'm hesitant to make sweeping recommendations until I've got better numbers. Like I say, I play on an RTX 3080 Ti, but I appreciate that me telling you to go out and buy that isn't particularly helpful to people on more restricted budgets. I'll keep working on data until I'm confident I can present more meaningful findings to you for VR specifically in this game. We've been through the core components that dictate performance, and the fundamental issue here is that the underlying PC should be able to support your target frame rates with ease. So long as you've got that headroom, you'll get a smooth and enjoyable experience. So when you're planning your PC for this sim, focus on a competent CPU, then add fast RAM to support it. Ensure you've got sufficient SSD space, but don't overspend there hoping for reduced loading times. Finally, make sure your GPU is appropriate for the resolution you want to run. In that respect, Flight Sim 2020 has really moved on from a game that was somewhat unique on launch owing to its heavy CPU dependence, to a game that's much more in line with overall gaming PC requirements, as it has matured and refined with performance updates over the last year. Best of all, because it's part of Microsoft's Game Pass, it's actually cheap or near free to try it out on your system, so you can gauge performance for yourself. We'd love to hear how you get on in comments. I'll round this video up by detailing my recommendations for PC component selections in 2022 that will deliver outstanding results in this title without breaking the bank. At the entry level to build a PC for flight sim that will run at 1080p with excellent performance and keeping a close eye on your budget, I'd recommend the following component choices. 
For the CPU, you really want to try and get an Intel i3-12100 at a bare minimum. It's a fantastic 4-core CPU that'll do really well. However, if you can afford that little bit extra to step up to the i5 range, then an i5-12400 or above is a really solid option, gets you those two additional cores, slightly more consistent performance, and just makes the CPU more flexible overall. I'd pair those with 16 gigabytes of 3200 MHz CL16 RAM to keep costs down and compatibility at a maximum. Some people do report problems running 3600 MHz RAM on those lower tier Intel CPUs. For motherboard, you can grab an Intel B660 motherboard and we do have videos making our recommendations for those so you can pick one that will allow the CPU to achieve full performance. You'll want a 500 gigabyte NVMe SSD as a minimum and they cost from around $60 and up. However, we would recommend one terabyte if you can afford it. 500 gigabytes is sufficient provided the PC is basically dedicated to Flight Simulator and nothing else. And for the GPU, at 1080p we'd recommend an RTX 2060, 3050 or 3060. Or on the AMD side, an RX 6600 or 6600 XT will work well. Overall, this total platform cost should work out around $770, plus additional for a power supply, case, monitor and any other peripherals you might need. Moving up to the mid-range, this is a PC really aimed at excellent 1440p performance with the GPU selections we've made and just a slightly more solid base specification to ensure that it's running the game really optimally for you. For the CPU, we'd be looking at the Intel i5 range with either the 12400, 12500, 12600 or 12600K. If you can step up to the i7-12700, that's also a really solid option. On the AMD side, if you're finding perhaps motherboards a little bit tricky to find for the Intel side, then the AMD Ryzen 5600X is a really solid option, or the 5800X now that's discounted as well. For RAM, we'd look at 16 gigabytes of 3600 MHz CL16 RAM, or if you can afford to step up to 32 gigabytes, that's a really good option as well, but do make sure you keep those speeds high and the timings low. For motherboards, Intel B660 motherboards are fine for the i5. Again, we'd advise you check out our video for our recommendations, because there are some motherboards that don't perform optimally with i5 CPUs. On the AMD side, the B550 motherboard range is really quite attractive. There's loads of good options from entry level up to high end. Again, we've got videos covering that on our channel, and that allows you to build a really solid system around the Ryzen 5600X. For SSD, we'd be looking at a one terabyte entry level NVMe SSD, and around $90 should see you right there. And for the GPU, again at 1440p, we'd be looking at the RTX 3060 Ti, RTX 3070, RTX 3070 Ti, or on the AMD side, the Radeon RX 6700 XT. Prices are falling and availability is improving, so it's now a really good time to start looking out for a GPU that fits your budget. The total platform cost we're looking at here is around $1,350, plus a PSU case, and again, any other peripherals you might need. And finally, at the high end, my recommendations for Flight Sim 2020, really getting the most out of it and running fantastic level visuals at 1440p ultrawide, 4K, or if you want to use a VR headset, would be as follows. For the CPU, I'd look at either the Intel i7-12700K, the i7-12700, which performs almost identically, but could save you a little bit of money, or if you want to go all out, there's the i9-12900K, but I will caution that you're spending an awful lot more money for a very small additional amount of performance with that CPU, and I think that budget would be better allocated elsewhere within the build. On the AMD side, you can get good performance out of the Ryzen 5800X or the 5900X, but at the moment, the older Lake 12th generation CPUs are the higher performing option. For RAM, we'd stick with DDR4 RAM if you're on the older Lake platform, and go for 32 gigabytes of DDR4 3600 MHz CL16 RAM. That really does strike the sweet spot of performance, ease of setup, and the cost as well. For motherboards, there's a good range of Intel Z690 motherboards for around $300. And on the AMD side, all you need is a B550 motherboard, around $150 gets you a good choice of boards that will run the recommended CPUs well. Again, for SSDs, there's no need to grow for anything particularly special. A one terabyte NVMe SSD is around $90. And for the GPU, if you are running at 1440p ultrawide or 4K, you are going to be needing to spend out on the GPU. We'd start with an RTX 3070 Ti and look around to RTX 3080s, 3080 Ti's, there's the 3090, and even now the RTX 3090 Ti as well. On the AMD Radeon side, you're going to be looking at at least an RX 6800 XT or the 6900 XT to get acceptable performance in this title. 
These GPUs will run well into four figures, but prices are now falling, so keep your eye out for any cards that are available at or near MSRP. The total platform cost for the PC itself will be around $2,000 plus a PSU and a case, but with high quality monitors, flight sim equipment, and any other peripherals you need, you will probably be looking at around four dollars to $5,000 for a total cost for a PC that will run this title absolutely optimally. Well, that about wraps it up for our testing of Flight Simulator 2020. I really want to thank you for watching. I hope you found this video useful and informative, and I really hope it's helped you make some decisions about the kind of components you need to be putting into a PC that's gonna get the absolute best out of this fantastic simulator. I'd also like to take this opportunity to introduce you to a project we've been working on behind the scenes. It's called buildpicker.com. It aims to take all of this information we've been gathering about the performance of different components, the things you should choose and the things you should avoid, and put them together into a one-stop site that allows you to pick the very best build for your needs. We've taken data from thousands of components, graded those components according to their value, and then put them into PC specifications that mean that you will always get the best possible build for any given budget and purpose. We've got a number of PC specifications in there already from gaming PCs to video editing PCs and more. So you can have a look and see what you think about the kind of builds it recommends. So please do drop us a comment either on this video or from the site itself. Let us know what you think could be improved or if you've had good results with it and the kind of builds it's recommending to you. Finally then, this is the section on test methodology and exactly how we configured these systems to run. Um, and this is really for your benefit, so that if you uh, want to understand a little bit more in depth about how we obtain the numbers we've presented in this video, you can check out this section before you get super angry in the comments and say I've done it all wrong. First up with the test systems, we didn't overclock the CPUs or GPUs under test other than when shown in the charts. And we did use PBO for the Ryzen CBEUs, which is enabled by default on the motherboards we tested with. We, we did overclock RAM for the RAM speed testing, and our settings are clearly indicated in those charts. The systems used motherboards that we've cross-checked to ensure that they perform properly at default specification, that is, they allow the CPUs to perform to their full potential. The CPUs were adequately cooled with at least a 240mm AIO to ensure they didn't thermally throttle. The bulk of our testing was done on Windows 10, although the older Lake CPU results are tested under Windows 11. We A to B tested and found the performance difference within, was within margin of error between the two operating systems. We spent a good deal of time developing and refining the benchmark runs we use. It took us over a year to finalise the exact settings and specifications to ensure that we were getting consistent data. They typify the worst case scenarios for this sim. The New York City flyover test is a three minute flight which leaves LaGuardia and heads over Manhattan at low altitude in a Daher light aircraft. It's run in chase cam and runs for three minutes from wheels up after takeoff until the Statue of Liberty passes out of view. It's a stern test of CPU owing to the volume of cityscape displayed as well as GPU given the photogrammetry and textures which we left on. The initial takeoff was omitted because originally this portion of the flight tended to corrupt 0.1% and 1% low figures with highly variable results run to run, something that's now been eliminated with game updates. To address this, we've got a second benchmark which is more CPU focused and demanding. This test involves a large aircraft, the 747, taking off from Heathrow in poor weather and lasts for the duration of the initial climb two minutes. The view remains internal. Because it is so CPU dependent, it's less revealing of GPU capability, so we haven't used it in those tests. We intend this to be more representative of a serious simmer's experience of this sim, using a demanding aircraft and the internal cockpit view. We didn't test third-party aircraft because these add-ins can drastically impact performance, and it just introduces too many variables to give meaningful results. Suffice to say, these tests represent some of the most demanding in-game circumstances, and actually the systems presented will dramatically outperformed the results in these tests in less complex flying conditions. We chose the settings we run at in these tests for a number of reasons. We wanted the tests to be representative and meaningful, so we opted for 1080p high-end visual settings for the bulk of the CPU and RAM testing. This is necessary to give insight into CPU performance, as at 4K you're almost entirely GPU limited. We also wanted the numbers to tally with real-world settings. We don't see that the value of presenting data obtained at 720p or low visual settings when no one will be using that in the game. It's also important that you're getting the best out of this game, and higher settings help it achieve the visuals it's capable of. We also wanted to provide a reference point you can tweak both ways from, increasing quality to ultra if you can accept lower frame rates, or lowering some settings to boost frame rates if preferred. 
Ultra settings do place a heavier load on the GPU, but the level of detail slide does heavily weight towards increasing CPU load. Therefore, I'd encourage everyone to test for themselves to find their own optimal balance of performance and visual fidelity. You can find settings optimization guides on many forums which go into much more depth than I can present here. We ran all tests with Bing data on, photogrammetry on, but live air traffic and weather conditions off in order to limit run-to-run -run variance over the testing it took to obtain these results. Talking about the game version and drivers, the game has been through a number of evolutions, but all the data presented here is from service update 7 of the game, after the major performance optimizations were made. The GPU data is current and was refreshed for this video. We used current drivers and up-to-date operating systems. We did not use any third-party content in the test, as this can have a dramatic impact on performance, although the hardware factors that impact their performance remain the same. In particular, some larger, complex and less well-optimized aircraft can be very detrimental to frame rates. <laughs> That's what AI piloting does for you. Brilliant. <laughs>